I'm really honored to be a part of this summit focused on national security. And I'm here with two experts in the fields of space and artificial intelligence. Joining me today are Dr. Paul Nielsen, CEO of Carnegie Mellon's Software Engineering Institute, and Stephen Kitte, Microsoft's Senior Director of Azure Space. Thank you both for joining me here today. Really appreciate you taking time out of your schedules. Oh, it's our, my pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you, it's great to be with you, Heather and Paul. Well, thank you both. The theme of this National Security Summit has really been on leading innovations and breakthrough technologies across all domains. And of course, today we're gonna to talk about two that are particularly important, space and artificial intelligence. And you are both experts in this area. And I'd like to discuss the transformational potential yeah, of these sure. two technologies. But before we jump in, it's really important to start with a definition of what this might mean to set the stage. And for either of you, but maybe Paul, I'll start with you. What's your definition okay. of well, artificial intelligence? Sure, sure. Well, I sort of like the, uh, the official DOD definition, which is a little bit ambiguous, and that's good. It says uh, a AI is the ability of machines to perform tasks that usually require human intelligence. Now that's a pretty broad definition, but one thing nice about it is it, it talks about the fact that this, this goes across a lot of different areas. And what we think of as AI kind of changes with time sometimes, because once we really have some algorithms that can do something like a, a human might do, sometimes we don't think of it as AI anymore. You know, when they uh, first develop a adaptive speed control for cars, that seemed pretty AI-ish, but now it seems just like automation. And uh, there's a lot of things like that. And, and, that. and saying automation, I wanted to bring up that too. Lots of times people get AI and automation mixed up. And while they can work together, they really are two different things. And you can have a fair amount of automation without any AI at all. And, and space systems have done that for years and years. That's a really good point. Uh, automation is unique. And Steve, do you have any thoughts on this? I really like that definition that Paul gave, where thinking about AI as tasks that humans normally would be doing. And if you, you know, we give an example of that, of uh, artificial intelligence just within the past year. Artificial intelligence, and this was in court, according to actually Stanford, they used um, chat GPT, chat GPT, which was powered by GPT-4, the latest large language model from OpenAI to pass the bar exam, which yes. is pretty amazing when you think about that. And it, it wasn't just the multiple choice. It was actually the written part as well. And it didn't necessarily get an average score and squeak by. It actually scored in the 90th percentile. So pretty amazing when you think about a task that a human would normally do that now we have computers performing. So I think that, you know, this is just one example, but artificial intelligence can do things like computer vision, where you're actually seeing and interpreting imagery, analyzing information, or even writing code. So there's a lot of areas that I think um, lead this to really being a watershed moment and an, an inflection point for artificial intelligence for us all to benefit from. Yeah, I think one thing uh, to find out, go a little bit further on what Steve said, one thing to remember is that um, AI is more than machine learning. Uh, 30 years ago, the, the big thing in AI was expert systems and, uh, and people were looking at those and we kind of ran out of uh, computational power and rules for them. Uh, we actually were exploring neural nets even 30 years ago when I was at uh, Rome Lab at the time. Uh, but then we didn't have the computational power that we have now. And the thing that's really changed in the last years, and, you know, started about 2008, uh, when in Canada, I think it was at uh, University of Waterloo, they started to apply the greatly increased computational power to doing these statistically based uh, AI kind of systems and uh, deep learning. And that's really changed almost everything. And I, I think what all of us have seen over the last months is that uh, this is a technology that applies to almost everything. It's a, it's a watershed technology that uh, we, we don't even know all the applications of it yet. 
Absolutely. It's uh, absolutely limitless, uh, frankly, just like the space domain itself. And Steve, I'm really glad you brought up uh, ChatGPT. I actually asked it. Uh, what it thought about the nexus of space and artificial intelligence. So I'll, if you will, I'll kind of give you the definition. Wasn't too bad, actually. Kind of yeah. talked about the two-way street. Technologies developed for space missions often find applications in AI, such as data analysis techniques and autonomous systems, you know, kind of buttressing on Paul's point. Mm -hmm. Additionally, AI plays a role in analyzing vast amounts of space-related data aiding in tasks like image recognition and pattern detection and optimizing spacecraft operations. I thought that was a really good point too. The intersection of space and AI continues to foster innovation in both fields. What do you think about that? Have you seen uh, innovation that's come around? Paul, you kind of touched on it. Steve, you also have? Well, certainly, I mean, geez, you know, in space, during my career, we started accruing so much information that we couldn't even process it all. Uh, we just don't have enough analysts uh, or enough eyeballs or hours of the day to do that. And so AI uh, methods have helped that a lot in uh, image interpretation, image recognition and such. In addition, uh, you know, as long as we understand some of the limitations of it, AI can help sort of throttle the data to looking at the most important data. Uh, you know, help select the data that we want to see. And at the same time, look for something that's anomalous, you know, in a, in a sense. And sometimes it's the anomalies that are the most interesting things, right? So I'm, I'm sure Steve has some more to say about that too. And I'd be curious what you'd think about the limitations too. Go ahead, Steve. Well, I think that, um, you know, as Paul was getting at, um, space and AI are really this perfect combination because what you're bringing together are these technologies and challenges that really go across a global scale. And Paul was mentioning the massive amounts of data that's coming from space. And if we look at where we're at in the space sector, there's not only this transformation that's happening with AI that we just spoke about, but there's a transformation happening with space as well, where more and more satellites are being launched. It's not only from the government, uh, but it's also from commercial companies around the globe that are doing things like Earth observation, collecting data, understanding the Earth, or doing things like communications, being able to um, uh, communicate across the globe through low latency signals. And what artificial intelligence is going to bring to that is to be able to help us see what's actually um, these satellites are producing images and other forms of sensors of. And it's going to be able to help us route data more efficiently through these networks, not only going through space, but also on the ground, because it is underpinned by this huge computational power that Paul was talking about, where fundamentally nowadays that's really cloud computing large amounts of data centers that are connected across the globe that are then bringing this data together to be processed and moved at speed and scale. So at Microsoft, you know, th this fits perfectly in our mission because our mission is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. So what we're doing now is taking these space technologies, taking artificial intelligence technologies, bringing them to governments, bringing them to enterprises and industries across the globe so that they can benefit and do their missions ultimately faster, do them more effectively and do them securely. Can I ask, Steve, um, to what degree do you think it might be evolutionary in terms of what AI could bring as a change versus revolutionary or transformational leapfrogging uh, where we've been in the past. Do you have a thought on that? I think it's revolutionary. This really, these technologies that we're talking about can offer so much advantage. And, and the way that we look at it at Microsoft and the way that you know I look at it personally is AI can be used as a co-pilot. You're not necessarily giving over control, although as Paul had mentioned earlier, you can use AI to automate tasks and make them happen much faster, but you can use artificial intelligence to improve your own decision-making. 
you have all this data that's out there. How do you use it to harness that data to make better decisions and to do it much more rapidly? And I do see that ultimately as a revolutionary advantage that we're going to be able to bring to governments. This is a national security series, so it's certainly going to advantage the military um, to be able to keep us safer and support global peace and security. Yeah, thank you. I, I like what uh, Steve, uh, the track Steve was on there, and I, I just want to maybe emphasize that as an engineer, one of the great things that AI does for space and for other fields is it really just opens up more design space. And for many of us that have been engineers over the last, uh, well, for me, 50 years, you know, we've lived in an era where the design sp space kept opening up from integrated circuits that became bigger and bigger and more capable, computational power that became more capable, software that became more. And now AI is the next tool that kind of accelerates that and gives us even more design space to design systems, to architect systems, to build systems that maybe can do things that are on the frontiers of what we think we can do, you know, that are pushing the state of the art of where we can be. Uh, so I, I, I think it's an exciting time to be an engineer of any stripe right now because of all the tools that are available. Oh, that's a that's a really good point. And as an engineer, do you have any thoughts on how you scope it or how you need to approach it with kid gloves or an appropriate recognition of huh? any limitations of this technology or the well, nexus? Sh sure. And you know, there's a lot of talk about that in there in the news. <laughs> and some famous people that are uh, you know, some of the pioneers in AI have, have raised some concerns and we should pay attention to those concerns. But I think all, all technologies have some things that can go a little wrong with them, uh, but that we have to remember that they are still created by people and people can put their mark on these things. I mean, one of the big issues in AI right now and one that DARPA is trying to address is that AI systems for the most part are a little brittle you know, and, and they'll make some mistakes, you know, so we have to understand that chat GPT every now and then says some strange things, you know. So uh, we, we haven't really gotten to the point of what uh, DARPA and others might say of uh, generalized intelligence, you know, a, a generalized artificial intelligence. Right now, things are pretty specific. And uh, the thing that I think is missing that humans have is context. You know, we, we have context when we apply ourselves to problems. And that context sometimes helps us from making bad mistakes. Even children have context in, in things when they do it. So AI is still a little immature and brittle at this point, and we have to be wary of that as it goes along. Uh, you mentioned the human side of the equation, near and dear to my heart, of course. And uh, what do you think about how we develop the talent that is involved oh. in these two different fields. Uh, you're at a university setting. Is there anything unique and different about oh. artificial intelligence or what companies need? Uh, what kind of yeah. skills we need to look for in developing the next generation? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, like, like other breakthroughs, like uh, CRISPR in the in the, the biological area, you know, um, uh, like some uh, like modified DR, uh, RNA, like Moderna did during the, the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of things going on, and usually when something breaks pretty fast, there's only a limited number of people who really have the training in those fields. You know, AI in a sense has been around for a long time. In a sense, you know, I mean, people were talking about AI in the 50s and 60s, but this recent version of AI has not. And the emphasis on AI and statistical methods and now ethical AI and more general AI is a new thing. And we, we don't necessarily have all the people trained to do that. Um, I, I, I've, I've been on lots of uh, defense science board studies and Air Force scientific advisory board studies. And uh, interestingly, in every one of them, one of the issues that comes up is the workforce. And how do you train the workforce? How do you keep the workforce up to date with things uh, in a fast moving, uh, technological ecosystem. And, you know, each of you knows this. I mean, the, the system is changing so fast that how do you keep people up to date? And uh, you want those new grads, but you also want grads that have experience. And, you know, as an older guy, I like to think maybe the older guys have, even have a little wisdom sometimes, you know, to, to blend with that experience because we, we have scars on our back every now and then. But it, this is a difficult thing. And it's across all of technology and all of DOD and all of national security space. Uh, there's no one area that probably can say, oh yeah, we have enough engineers and scientists to do this. 
Steve, bring us the uh, company perspective, if you will. <laughs> so um, I really appreciate what Paul was saying about how fast this technology is moving. And people do need to embrace it and experiment with it because it is changing so fast. And what is um, important here is it's not just to be thinking about this for, you know, the IT shop. And this is something that the IT shop is going to handle, but it actually goes throughout the mission of the organization to be embracing these technologies. And, you know, I read something once that gave this, um, you know, saying that um, AI isn't going to replace your job. What's going to replace your job is people who don't embrace AI insofar as how is it changing the modern workforce and ensuring that you're staying current with it and improving the work that you're doing today by understanding these technologies. And I think what's really exciting about what's changed maybe over the past, you know, as Paul mentioned, it has been decades that there have been advances in AI, but where we're at today is you don't need a PhD to actually use it. You know, you had mentioned that you put in a question and it's a chat GPT and ask something. And these are the types of things that, you know, I look at uh, when, you know, we all have a tie to the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, in fact, I was there working under General Nielsen when he was the commander of it. And, uh, and I think about these tools and if I had them as a lieutenant, as a program oh, gosh, manager yes. working uh, in the Air Force, it would be extremely helpful. Well, while we've been talking about AI, Heather, I'd like to loop back uh, briefly to space, though, and remind people that, you know, space, we've been involved in space since the 50s, but space is going through quite a renaissance right now, too. And, um, you know, in, in the 90s, I worked in, around U.S. Space Command, and we kind of had this long-range space plan that was forecasting all these launches didn't quite come to pass, but now they are coming to pass. And, you know, when you see not only the, uh, the various nations that are involved in space doing very aggressive and innovative missions, but the private companies that have started to really flow into the space sector, it's a new world for space. And that's going to generate so much innovation of its own. So space is in a really innovative era right now. And AI is in an innovative era right now. When two things like that cross, uh, you just got to kind of watch out because there's just so much coming. And uh, it, it, we're almost just limited by imagination on what things we can do with both of these things right now. So uh, one of the things we've studied at Space Foundation is the number of companies and the number of uh, countries yep. that are involved in the space economy. And it's just been skyrocketing every year. There yes. are new and new companies joining, uh, new countries oh, yeah. that are developing their own programs. And so do either of you, but maybe Steve, this is uh, better targeted for you. Do you have advice for how a new company who wants to take advantage of this technology, how they might do so. So maybe they do have the will and they want to, what <laughs> steps would you recommend? So um, I'd recommend three steps. And the first is moving fast and embracing these technologies. Number two would be, and we spoke a little bit about that, number two would be embracing cloud computing because that really is the foundation of the technology that we're talking about. And the benefit of the cloud is it enables users to not make these large capital investments in their own infrastructure, but rather buy capabilities as a service and then scale it up as they need. So there's a cost piece of that, but then there's really an effectiveness piece when we're talking about these new and innovative technologies. And then the third piece would go to the point of not just thinking about this for the IT shops, but thinking about this across an organization to help enable missions. I absolutely agree with you. And uh, there are some people who advocate that it's not the application of AI to the operations, but to the business end and some of those other mm -hmm. uh, normal business functions where you really get some advantages for this massive approach, you know, the data processing of all that 
uh, data that companies uh, create. Mm -hmm. So, uh, really great thoughts. Um, so, before we kind of move to the last couple questions, I wanted to ask, do you have any thoughts on the limitations of AI? Uh, Paul, you mentioned, you know, we're accelerating at such a rapid pace, uh, both in space and in artificial intelligence. So, this is a right an extremely dynamic time. Uh, what are some caveats or, you know, buyer beware? What would you recommend? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I did mention already the brittleness of some of these systems. The fact that um, and they sometimes can be uh, spoofed, fooled, faked, um, maybe poisoned, you know. They depend on both a lot of computational power and a lot of data. And there's some issues there. Uh, sometimes the, um, the answers they come up with can, can have been poisoned intentionally or can be biased even unintentionally. And we've all heard of stories about that, where, you know, if you train, if you train it on a certain system, it's going to reflect that system. And so uh, if you trained it on a, a, a population of mostly men, it's going to favor mostly men. <laughs> it's not going to hire a lot of women at that point, right? Uh, so we, we have to recognize the, the brittleness of these things. And then I, I like to keep coming back to the fact that we have to recognize the, um, um, the, the inability of it to actually put things in context. Sometimes when we see chat GPT come up with beautiful prose, we think it's thinking, but it's not thinking. <laughs> it's doing a statistical prediction of what the next words are based on what the input was there and then kind of pushing it out. And, it, it says a lot that it comes out so well, you know, I mean, it sounds like a person wrote this, but it's not thinking in the sense that a human being thinks. And so we have to be a little wary of, uh, uh, of uh, anthropomorphizing these things and making them sound like they really are thinking when they're not. Uh, they're doing stuff based on statistical methods that are good methods, but they're statistical methods. Really great. Steve? And if I can build upon that, um, in particular, when talking about large amounts of data, and there's two pieces I've hit, I'd hit on related to that. One is the management of that data and ensuring that you're bringing a structured approach to actually manage this large amounts of data. So when we're talking about space data, for instance, we're building out something called the planetary computer, which manages massive amount, petabytes and petabytes of space data in an optimized and standardized fashion to then be able to bring applications like artificial intelligence on top of that. But the other really important point um, when thinking about data is public data versus your data. And that's whether you're a government or you're an enterprise or you're just a, a personal you know, citizen and you want your data separate from what's training these large models for everybody. So ChatGPT and OpenAI run their services on Azure. And we have a capability called Azure OpenAI that's currently in our commercial clouds. It's coming to our government and classified clouds this year. So government users and enterprises are able to keep their data separate. So you're able to have the large language model out there, but then ground the, um, the, the data and the questions that you're asking with just your own information, but that's just for your organization, whether it's classified for the government or whether it's an enterprise. And that's really important. So when you talk about pitfalls and understanding how you're moving forward with this, you have to understand how you're bringing your data into this and ensuring you're doing it in a way that's safe, that's protected, that you have the right transparency within your organization um, and, and the right privacy. Yeah, we're working on some projects just like that, Steve, for the uh, Intel community of taking you know general purpose large language models, but bringing them into an enclave, a secure enclave, and then training them on their data you know, so it's not spread out back to the cloud and then classify, but, you know, to, to write things the way an analyst would write it or to look for the things that an analyst would care about. And I think some companies have found this to be very important because if you expose your data to the general large language models, your data is now part of those models. 
Yeah. And that might not be what you want if you have proprietary data to go out there. Right. Uh, recently, there's been the case where what the New York yes. the New York Times yeah, is, is, is yeah. suing uh, because they said, wait a minute, you, you ask this model something that was written in the Times and it comes out looking like it was written by the Times and that, that's, that should be copyrightable or something like that. So there's some issues still to be looked at there, I think. What's the difference between copyrightable data and fair use of data? That still <laughs> remains to be determined in the U.S., I guess. <laughs> but I, I think the whole point about paying attention to your data and what you want to protect, how much of it, uh, it you know, yes. data is the new oil to run this engine. And um, it all, that's another area that if someone's you know, looking to enter into or take advantage of the opportunities that AI and space yes. can have together, it starts with the data. And so having it in the right formats, having it stored in the right places, as you mentioned, Steve, and making it accessible. And frankly, just creating that data. And I know a lot of space companies uh, are paying attention to what data they are creating and how they're leveraging that for their bottom line. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really great point. Okay, this time uh, really flew by and I wanna end it on yes. our uh, question that has to do with who are you watching for the next big breakthrough in either of these areas or the two as they come together? Steve, what do you think? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of innovation that's happening in this sector. We've got great partners we're working with, large like OpenAI or small companies, like for instance, there's one uh, called Synthetic where they can do rapid uh, identification of objects in satellite imagery without a large amount of labeling in advance. And in fact, they were able to find a Chinese balloon that was traversing across the globe very rapidly. Uh, with satellite imagery and with their artificial intelligence technology. So um, we'll be working with a partner ecosystem and, um, and ultimately focused on our customers and helping enable them, enable their missions, empower them to achieve more. And I expect a lot of exciting things to come ahead um, in this area. How about you, Paul? Yeah. Well, um, similar to what Steve has said, you know, I, I would watch the, the, the great and small uh, software based companies, because in the US, uh, they've shown the ability to scale really fast to things when they find something they know how to scale. This has not been as, as we would all have to admit, this has not been the province of government sometimes <laughs> to scale fast. But, uh, but US industry has always been so innovative in this area and so quick to grasp these things and move. So I, I would watch US industry. I don't know where, you don't know whether it's a new company to pop up, just like most of the big companies we know now didn't exist 20 years ago. They've all popped up, you know, uh, and, and done so well, uh, or whether it's, uh, um, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the large or one of the smalls, one of the non-existent companies that's out there, I guess I would say. The other thing I, I think we have to be mindful of is to watch some of the other countries, in particular China. China has a, a lot of really smart people a lot of them have been trained in the U.S. even, you know, and uh, and they have lots of data. And if uh, data is the currency, they got more data than almost anybody on their people, on their society, on everything. Now, and I don't think they're the only country that's in that position, but there's there's certainly one. Uh, I, I would not overlook India, which has developed its own great software companies over the time and uh, see what they have to do, too. Uh, I, I opened up by uh, earlier by saying it's just an exciting time to be an engineer. And I just want to come back to that. And, you know, each of us was fortunate to be an engineer in our careers. And some of you still are. <laughs> I'm a bureaucrat now. But uh, I think that um, it's a wonderful time to be an engineer. And uh, the, the design space is so open. There's so many problems that society faces that need to be solved as well. Right. And so this is a time for us to put our thinking hats on and start to address the problems that we see as a, as, a, as a race, as a humanity. Oh boy, I couldn't have said it any better, Paul. Thank you for uh, those final comments. And thank you, Steve, for joining me here today. What a 
cool. really great discussion. You know, we covered so many topics. We covered uh, the talent, we covered the countries and the companies and the many, many opportunities that both AI and space have together. And yes. uh, I, I would say the future is bright. Uh, but we do have to be cognizant of how this could go awry if we don't keep our eye on the ball. So, um, yes. boy, it's been a true pleasure having you both here. Thank you, thank you so much, and uh, have a great day. This is all we have here for you today, and back over to you, David.